That brings me to the business at hand. And I believe that the devil is alive and well, just like God is. And I believe he wants to kill, steal, and destroy, and he wants to discourage, and he wants to derail the church from its mission. And it's very important that we understand our mission, and for the last few weeks, I've been talking to you about relationships. As a matter of fact, my son, who I think is pretty creative, some people have mixed emotions, it's like anything in ministry, but, uh, you know, we try to do different things to, to get our point across. You'll notice these connections here, and I've been talking about purposeful relationships. Would you agree that the most important thing in this world and the world to come is relationships? And it's the only thing that you're going to take with you. You're going to leave all the stuff behind your computer, your car, your house or homes if you own multiple dwellings, your camp, your toothbrush. It's all going to be left behind. But what you are going to take into eternity is the relationships you formed, especially those in Christ. And so these little dots, I started with the children and the children's sermon, and we talked about how we are all connected and so, you know, this might be dad, and this might be mom, and then, of course, they had you, and then there's grandma back here, and then there's your next-door neighbor, and, you know, then there is the, the guy you work with way over here, the lady at the convenience store, and the person that you may meet once in your life on an airplane. And uh, we are all connected because we all go back to the same parents. We are all part of the Adams family. <laughs> That's a scary thought, isn't it? And we're all in, in Adams family, but thank God that when we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we have another connection, and we are connected to those brothers and sisters we don't even know that are losing their lives today. And so relationships are really, really important, and I've been stressing the fact that the, the, the purpose of relationships, uh, I really believe, uh, in order for them to be really purposeful, it's not for me to know you and to talk with you or to communicate with you or to work with you or to deal with you, but it actually uh, the most purposeful relationships have to do with God. And... Uh, in the chapter that we're just starting out, if I ever get there in my class, uh, we've been on the scriptures for three weeks. I wanted to get in to start God because we're teaching the Baptist faith and message. Uh, but as I was reading it uh, for God, which we didn't get to today, we just finished up canon of scripture, pseudepigraphal, gospels, and if you're curious about that, you have to come to the next class. And uh, that'll be not next week, but the week following, because we have a wedding coming this week, and we're exciting about that. Our, our, our little son, our baby, is, is going to be married to a beautiful girl, both inside and out, and we're, we'll be there. Uh, and Tim is going to be preaching for me next week. But this is what it says in the Baptist Faith and Message as you begin the introduction to God. The most important and urgent knowledge humans can ever possess is the knowledge of the one true living God. This is the beginning and the end of all genuine knowledge. And knowing God is the highest privilege given to humanity. Can you say amen to that? In addition, the knowledge of God is the foundation of the Christian worldview, setting it apart from all other worldviews. Our concept of God and our belief that he exists makes all the difference in the way we look at the world and live our lives, and it should. At the same time, we must be very careful not to make certain that our knowledge of God is or excuse me, to make certain that our knowledge of God is based solidly on the Bible and not on human speculation. Why is this a concern? Researchers indicate that only a bare fraction of Americans are atheist or agnostic, 4%. If you took this fact at face value, you would think that America must be experiencing a great revival and spiritual recovery. This is hardly the case. The sad truth is that many Americans have only a superficial idea of God. The God they imagine is not the living God of the Bible, but more a product of sentimentality. Human wisdom does not reveal God's true nature, nor can 
the human imagination even come close to his glory. True wisdom comes by knowing God as he has revealed himself in the scriptures. As God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, the wise must not boast in his wisdom, the mighty must not boast in his might, the rich must not boast in his riches, but the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and that he knows me. Praise God. I think that is so beautiful. And so when you consider our purposeful relationships, are they in God? Are they around God? Are they about God? And are they about connecting our mother, our father, our grandmother, our grandfather, our neighbor, the person at the convenience store or at Lowe's that we see often? Is that connecting those people to the true and living God? And that is the greatest purpose, that's the greatest priority and the greatest privilege. Now today's outline, if you did get it, did you get an outline in the bulletin today? You didn't, okay. Um, We had a little snag. Is that the best thing I can say to it? And uh, and it it just didn't work out, okay? And so what you're gonna have up here today is what you got. It's gonna be like the old days, okay? And how many of you remember the days before we even had these? I remember when I bought the overhead projector. Uh, you, you thought I would have brought demons into the sanctuary that day. Man, we're showing words on the wall in the sanctuary. I can't believe it. And uh, all kinds of opinions and whatever. And so, you know, we tried to get the message across. We are living in 2014. Okay? So... You're going to have it up here, and as a matter of fact, I was going to comment on the outline that if you took this outline home and you looked at it, you probably wouldn't make sense of it. And so maybe it was divine intervention (laughs) that you didn't have it today, so you wouldn't go through that. But what I do want to say to you is that what I wanted to do was put the bare necessities down in the outline so that they could be like examples to you and you could go look. But on their own, they might not make sense. And what I I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, really, I pray through this all that God will light a fire in our heart, in your heart, to make sure that we are just not cultivating relationships for just, you know, kind of human, mundane, utilitary uh, reasons, but that we're doing them for more than time, but for forever. Can you say amen? Amen. Because we want to see those people rightly related to God, and we want to see them in heaven. How many of you want to see your neighbor in heaven forever? How many of you want to see your grandmother in heaven forever? How many of you want to see, you know, the guy you work with that gives you a hard time in heaven? And he needs to be in heaven because he'll be different then. And so will you. And so you think you're the only one who prays. He may not be a Christian, but he may be praying for you today. And that may be the only prayers that he prays. And so, uh, as I looked at uh, SBC Life, Southern Baptist, you know we're the second largest denomination in America. Did you know that? Catholics are number one, 53 million adherents and declining. Southern Baptists are supposed to have, you know, uh, uh, the next largest, and the number just escapes me because I'm getting old. But the fact is, is that this is what happened this year. This year's baptism numbers are a heartbreak. I remember when our confession set a goal of eight to one. That means that it took eight Southern Baptists to win one person to convert to faith in Christ. This is by Frank Page, who is our president at this current time. In 2013, our ratio of church members to baptisms is more to 51 to 1. What does that mean? It has been said of Southern Baptists, we are one of the most evangelical groups in all the world. We believe in the Bible completely, from cover to cover, including the maps. We are people of the book. And we believe in sharing our faith across the street and around the world. We have over 5,300 full-time foreign missionaries. 
while we are evangelical, other denominations, and I don't need to name them, are not evangelical at all. Their growth comes from someone has a child in their congregation, in their congregation they infant baptize them, they know nothing of Christ, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, but because their parents do it as a rite and a ritual to the church, he or she is baptized, and they are not Christians. Because to become a Christian, you have to put your faith in Christ. Does that make sense? So in many other denominations, they are simply baptizing individuals, calling them Christians, and they're not. Because it's a personal decision that you have to make. And so that compounds the problem. But when I look at it, uh, it now takes 51 members of probably the mo one of the most evangelistic groups that are out there. And... Uh, First, our churches reported 310,368 baptisms this year, the lowest number of baptisms since 1948, which, by the way, was the first time baptisms have topped 300,000. Last year, report baptisms came from 27,179 churches. And only, uh, as we look at our denomination, only half of the churches reported in many, and, and his Amy here? Amy, raise your hand. Where are you, Amy? Over there. She hates when she has to fill out this report. But let's give Amy a hand because she does it every year. It's, it's vital for us to know how we're doing. Now, I want to bring it down to our church life, and then I'll quickly get into the message and, and hopefully share something from God that is going to move your heart and mind in, in the way of examples. And I, I hope that goes quickly and well. But half of the churches didn't report, and many that did left the baptism blank, blank, completely blank. So that means we have churches with 5,000 members and, re, and more that reported zero baptisms for the year. Now, as you look at me, you should be concerned because in a membership of 250 or 260, it should be on your mind, how many people did we baptize last year? And why baptism is not conversions? Because it takes a little bit more seriousness for people to follow through of saying, yes, I've given my life to Jesus, to going down into a baptismal pool and standing before the world and say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And not everyone who comes down the aisle, shakes a hand and prays a prayer, is really sincere with God. And many of you have seen people do that only to see they disappear after. Now, that's not anything new, is it? Jesus said those kind of things would happen, and so did Paul. And so we've got to understand that we need to be deeply involved because there are many people where they are simply just not sharing Jesus with other individuals and connecting people to God through him. And by the way, there's no other way. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Your neighbors are not going to be okay. Your grandmother is not going to be okay. Or grandfather is not, or your children are not going to be okay without Jesus. Can you say Amen. So we ought to be deeply concerned about that this morning. And so we're going to look into the early church. And what I hope is that we do not miss our mission, that we do not get derailed, even in the face of maybe some of the difficulties and some of the things I described, that we will be more on mission for Christ than ever before. It would be a shame to get lost on the way to our mission. And I wanted to share this from our director of missions to illustrate it. A funeral director asked a bagpiper to do him a favor and play at a graveside service for a homeless man who had no family or friends. The service was to be at a pauper cemetery in Nova Scotia backcountry. The bagpiper was not familiar with the backwoods and got lost. When he finally arrived an hour late, he saw that the funeral guy had evidently gone and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and the crew left and they were eating lunch. He felt badly and apologized to the men for being late. 
He went to the side of the grave, looked down at the concrete vault lid, was already in place, and he didn't know what else to do, so he started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. He played like he never played before for this homeless man with no family or friends. As he played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. When he finished and was putting the bagpipes in the car, he heard one of the workers say, I've never seen anything like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> You'd appreciate that, right, John? Would you admit that this man got lost on the way to his mission? Would you say what he did was good, but he missed the real opportunity? Wouldn't it be a shame for the church, even our church? And we baptize a lot. I've got to say, there are people that have said to me, Pastor, I've been in churches in this area, and that's typical. We go from church to church. And sometimes it's just transfer growth, and it's not reaching the lost. And, you know, we, Lord help us and all of that, okay? But the fact is, is that we, Jesus said this. Uh, he said the field is white unto harvest. Is it still white? But he said the problem is not with the harvest. Don't kid yourself thinking that people are not interested or not needy. That need to be informed and told the truth in Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus said the problem was? The workers are few. And we can sing our songs, and we can have slideshows, and we can have wonderful decorations to illustrate. But if we don't serve the gospel, woe is me. Amen? So let's look at the Word of God this morning, and I pray that God moves you. I pray that God moves you because it's not about high-powered holy men going out and winning the lost. It's about every Christian who believes in Jesus sharing their faith, I'm in a real way, in an understandable way, with individuals and them coming to Christ. And so this is part four of this message, and this is what I want to suggest to you. This is what I want to suggest to you today. Are you ready? Okay. First of all, this is what John said. Now, this is eternal life. Have you ever wondered what eternal life is? People talk about eternal life all the time. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Muslims, Buddhists talk about eternal life. But this is what the scripture says. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's it. That is what eternal life is. You notice it's not a thing. It's not a possession. It's not a place to go. It's a person. And it's a relationship with a person, namely God our Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, and his Spirit. If you know by faith the Father, Son, and Spirit, you have eternal life. Praise God. If you don't know him, you don't. And the scripture makes that perfectly clear. There's no gray area. There's no iffiness in that. Jesus said, either you have it or you don't. Either you're a saint or you ain't. Can you say amen? Either you're in or you're out. And that's the way the scripture says it. And we are fuzzy about that. And maybe if we weren't, we would be much more aggressive in our prayers and in our witness to people because people need Jesus Christ. So the first thing I want to suggest is start where they are. Start where the people are. Where, where do you go fishing? Does anybody tell me where you go fishing? Does anybody go fishing where fishes aren't? If you want to catch fish, where do you go? You go, you go to where the fish are. And so you got to start where they are. Where are they? Well, they hang out at coffee shops, don't they? They get together at family reunions. They come to church. Do you think everybody who's here today is truly saved? And there isn't anyone here that needs someone to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't kid yourself. 
there's people who need Jesus right here. They're not far. And so uh, they're all around us. Start where they are. Notice the Apostle Paul. And again, this is why this outline, if you just picked it up, wouldn't make sense, but it does when I explain it to you. Why Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of what? Idols. So Paul is where? He's in Athens. Where is Athens? It's in Greece. So he's over in Greece. He comes in the town, and he's greatly distressed, and that's where it starts for you. Are you greatly distressed for your grandma, for your father, for your neighbors, that they do not have a relationship with God? And if you don't have a relationship with the real God, and you claim to be religious, then you must be worshiping an idol, something that's not God. Does that make sense? And so while Paul was waiting for them, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. How many of you are burdened, heavily burdened, for those that you know and love that don't have a relationship with God? It's all fuzzy. They have ideas. They have notions, but they don't have the truth. They have a caricature of God instead of, a, of the true God as their possession. And you may be here today, and you don't have anything but your own notions. And hopefully, I'm here to help you today. So Paul was greatly distressed, and he came to the city. It was full of idols. Now, Paul understood that. And so when he came to meet with these people, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus. I hope I'm pronouncing that somewhat right, and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Notice that Paul didn't stay up, say, stand up and say, you are a bunch of pagans. He said, you're very religious. He almost flattered those people. And sometimes when we have to speak, speak with people of different faith, it would be better for us not to say that they're, they're complete idiots, but the fact is, is that they have some spiritual interest, which is a starting point, by the way. Can you say Amen. So if they're Catholic or Methodist or whatever they are, if they have some spiritualist interest, at least you're, you're started and you're not starting from scratch. And that's where they are. But if they were from scratch, then you need to start from scratch as well. Start where they are. And so I see that in every way you are very religious for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, did he say, it made me throw up. Is that what he said? It made me sick. You guys are so stupid. Is that what he said? No, he didn't. He said, I even found an altar. You guys got all your bases covered. It, uh, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And then what does Paul do after that? He starts with creation. He connects it to the creator, and then he's like Spurgeon. He makes a beeline for the cross. Can you say amen? And that's what he does. And it's amazing that at the end of this, or at a conclusion for this, guess what the conclusion was? Some believed him. That's cool, isn't it? Some believed him. And it said that some didn't, and they broke into a lot of discussion. And that's going to happen. Is everyone we share with going to fall down on their knees and say, I got it. Let's pray right now before you leave. I want to receive Jesus Christ. No, that's not going to happen. But the fact is, some are going to believe. Some are going to believe a little bit more. And some are going to argue. And that's just is what's going to happen. But, like someone told me a long time ago, no doesn't mean no forever. Can you say amen? No can mean no for now. And there's a lot of people, how many of you, when you first heard the gospel, you took a hook, line, and sinker? Or did you consider? Did you do some research? Did you mull it over before you finally said yes to Jesus? And so Paul uh, was there, and he started where the people are. And notice, uh, uh, even Peter does the same thing. And we'll get to that in just a second. Share the scriptural information. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of the heaven and the earth and does not live in temples built by hands. 
So their ideas about God were being challenged and the truth about God were being clarified. And Jesus had to often do that. You know, he started where with the woman at the well? Somebody tell me, tell me where he started. He started with the fact about water and the well. But he moved on to talk about water and the well, and he said, talked about what? Worship. And she brought up and said, you know, the Jews say that we're supposed to worship over there, it's location, and then we say we are supposed to worship over there, which is really correct. And the fact is, is Jesus started where she was and worked with her very patiently, even getting down to her lifestyle and said, listen, um, you know, you've had, where's your husband? So it's great we could talk about theology and it's great that we could talk about concepts and we can be clarified, but let's look at your life. And Jesus knew that this lady had five failed relationships. She had connected emotionally, probably physically, with five other guys. Only for those relationships to dissolve and for her to have an emptiness in her soul that she decided she didn't want commitment in marriage anymore and she would just settle for some guy living with her. We used to call that shacking up. Do you remember? Our culture ideas change a lot, don't they? But aren't you glad God's word never changes? Praise God. And it's better that they know the truth. And Jesus was concerned not only about her theology, but her lifestyle. And he knew the crushed spirit that she had and the hopes that were dashed. And I'm not here to condemn anyone, but I'm telling you, Christ is trying to lead you to a better life. Can you say amen? He wanted it for that lady. He wants it for you. That better life is found in his truth, in knowing him. Because when you know him, then you want to live for him. Now, I want to say, uh, none of us are perfect in this room. Praise God. And there's none of us could stand up and look down on anybody else because we all need the grace of God. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? But there is correction. Amen? Amen? Amen. There is correction. And that's really hoping. It's for our good. So as Jesus connected with individuals like the woman at the well or Zacchaeus, I really believe that when Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, he didn't talk about well water. You know what I think he talked to him about? I think he talked to him about money. Do you know why he talked to him about money? Because that was his problem. And at the end of Jesus getting done talking with this man and enlightening him about theology, he talks to him about everyday life and he says, now let's talk about your life. And then isn't it wonderful to see the transformation because when Nicodemus comes out of it, what does he say? He goes out and says, if I've stolen from anyone, I'll give you four times as much of what I took. I wonder how many people accepted that. Would you say that that guy was changed? that that guy was transformed. I believe that he was. So the God who made the world and everything in it, he starts where he is not served by human hands as if he has needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else and from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets. Do you notice what he's doing? He's appealing to the culture of that day, which he's very familiar with. He's on their turf. He's on their ground. And he's deeply concerned about these people, and he connects. Therefore, since we are God's offering, we should not think that a divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands 
all people, everywhere to do what? There are gospel tracts that are printed today, and I'm sorry, but they leave out repentance. But you cannot be saved without repentance. You can't. We can overlook it in our culture, but we have to deal with the sin issue and the need to change. How many of you are glad that Jesus confronted the sin issue is in your life and that he continues to do that because he wants the very best for you? But to become a Christian means that you repent. It means you change direction. It means that a transformation takes place. Too many people have received Jesus and no change visible has taken place. And I just want to tell you, people will say, well, you don't know what's going on in their heart. If it's in your heart, it's going to come out in your actions. It's going to. It's got to. The Holy Spirit cannot live in a person without somehow there being some evidence of a change that's taken place in their life. Because we are on our way to Christ-likeness. Amen? God took us from where we are, but he's not satisfied to leave us there. He wants us to become like his son. He desires that we grow into his image more and more. So he starts where they are, and then he shares the biblical information. And notice Peter does the same. Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Careful, listen carefully to what I say. Now he's talking to Jews. Is he going to start with the creation of the world? No. He's going to start in a totally different place because the Jews know about all that. They're monotheistic and they believe in Jehovah. So he's going to go on and start where they are and he's going to lead them. And guess what the result was at the end of his message? Some believed, some didn't, and some had questions. And that's the same result that you and I are going to have as we share the gospel. The next thing is say your story. As, as, as knowledgeable as the Apostle Paul was, when he shared the scriptures, when he shared the Holy Scriptures with individual, he didn't stop there, but he shared about, this is what Jesus has done for me. And have you shared with people what God has done for you? Do you remember the demoniac we talked about last week? Jesus comes to his shoreline, a madman runs out, meets him at the shoreline, and they're face to faith, and the demons are talking to Jesus, and Jesus is talking to the demons. Do they know he has power and that, they have authority, that, he, that Jesus has authority? Absolutely. After he gets done casting out this legion of demons, it says there this crazed man was, and chains would not hold him. They tried to chain him down. But they could not hold him. They could not keep him. It says that he was sane, clothed, and in his right mind. Would you say that that's a difference? Praise God. He asked the question, Jesus, I will go with you anywhere, do anything you want, and you can understand why. How would you like to spend years naked, running around in a graveyard, shunned by society, cutting yourself and screaming every night, then meeting Jesus and being transformed where you're in your right frame of mind. You're sane again. The prospect of you having a normal life has finally come back to you. No wonder he said, I'll follow you anywhere. Shouldn't that be the confession of every person who's put their faith in Jesus. I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything for you. And Jesus said this, go home. Where was home? Well, it was back in the village that they wouldn't let him back into. And can you imagine when that guy coming down the street clothed, no longer crazed, and people would come out and look, See, that's the guy we chained up. That's the guy we couldn't control. That's the maniac. That's the demoniac. That's the guy that was so unsafe. That's the guy who was insane. 
And I'm sure they were careful, but they saw that man completely change. And what did that man tell them? Did he tell them about theology? Did he talk about the weather? Did he said, boy, I got to cut it up on sports. I've been out of it for a long time. Who, who, who won the, the Olympics, by the way, last year? Is that what he said? He went and tell his friends, I met Jesus and everything is different. I was a nutcase. You know it. And only this miracle has happened to me. And I believe that guy talked about Jesus. He went back to his family. He went back to his friends. Can you imagine when he came into the coffee shop? What an amazing thing. And you think that's nuts. But some of the guys you used to hang with will be just as surprised at the transformation that you have made and I have made. So tell people your story. And it doesn't take long. Do you know you can share the gospel in about 20 seconds? And I've done it before. You're at a counter. There's a person behind it. You strike up a conversation. How long does it say? I was once lost without hope and help in the world. Then I heard about Jesus, that he was the Son of God, died, rose again to pay for my sin. I admitted I was a sinner. I turned away from my sinful life sign, and now I'm following him, and my life is so much better. Was that 20 seconds? Praise the Lord. Can you do that? Can I do that? Do we need to do that? Absolutely. You know what keeps us from doing that? The fear. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I too was convinced that I ought. Another occasion, another place. Apostle Paul telling his story again. I too was convinced that I ought to do all this. Wouldn't it be great? You're with somebody and you're telling them, you're, and you're saying, listen, my marriage was, was in the toilet. Is that common everyday language? Do people understand that? Oh, I could use something more churchy. It was in the commode. Okay? And, and we didn't know what we were going to do. We couldn't get along to save our life. We were headed for divorce. Then I went to this crazy church, Cross Point Church, with that nutty Italian pastor. I heard the gospel. My wife and I, we sat there. We were in tears. This has happened before. I've had couples come to my house. We were doing the 40 Days of Purpose Bible study. I'm there sharing with these individuals. They're completely lost, and they were living together, which is not the end of the world. And uh, I'm reading it, and I, I get to the end. of the second or third session. And I say, you know, take this tract home and read it. And I just got done sharing the gospel, what Jesus had done for my wife and I. 11 o'clock at night, telephone rings. Uh, Pastor Sam, we're so-and-so, and we were at your Bible study. As a matter of fact, it's like the third time that we've come. And we just want you to know that we got to the end of that little booklet we gave, you gave us, and my wife and I were in tears. And we prayed that little prayer at the end. Those folks are still walking with the Lord today. They've moved away. Has their life been pain-free? No, but they're saved. And I'm going to see them in heaven. And folks, that needs to happen over and over and over and over again. But we've got to overcome this fear, and we've got to be able. So I just want to ask you, can you do this? Can you start where people are? If they're hunters, avid hunters and sportsmen, where should you start? If that's their world. If they're into football and they know every name of every person and every jersey that's out there, where should you start? Probably start with football. If you're with a lady and she's into gardening and that's her life, or music, or dancing, maybe where should you start? I was with a bunch of guys just this Saturday. They're all older than me, except for one who came in a little bit later. 
And you know, I got introduced to a whole new bunch of guys that I don't usually hang with. So I'm a little nervous. What am I going to talk to them? How am I going to connect to these people? So, you know, I talked about stuff like the new store that opened. Did you know there's a new store that opened in Rome? Anybody, if you see that running store? It's, it's really cool. Oh, yeah, I saw that. My kid goes there. It's really interesting, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm trying to connect. You know the one place where I found that I connected when I asked this question? Do you have any children? Oh, yeah, I've got three. And the minute that that guy said three, guess what a guy who didn't say much to me started doing? Just ask me about my grandkids, okay? Just say, do you have grandchildren? And get ready, okay? Just get ready. We connected about children. Oh, you got two boys and a girl. How are they doing? No. Oh, my daughter's going to Germany. I can't believe it. She's getting on an airplane and she's traveling over. I said, what's she going to do there? And we got into a nice conversation about what? Oh, you got kids. Yeah, I got kids. You got kids. We all got kids. Isn't that wonderful? It's like ice cream with Bill Cosby. Same thing. But in my heart... I'm praying. I'm praying for those guys. One guy's got serious cancer. I've been praying for him for probably six months. And the guy I'm there with cares, cares about that guy's soul. And the rest of the guys, how can you have coffee and breakfast with somebody on a weekly basis and be a Christian and not care? How can you be at the hospital working with another person and wondering heaven or hell and not Care. It starts with a burdened heart. You start where they are. So can you start where they are? Yeah, can you start where they are? Can you share the scripture? Yeah, you probably can. Not all the scripture in the world. Can you say your story? Please say yes, this will go a lot faster. Okay? All right? Yes, you can share your story. This is what Jesus is doing. Now, does it have to be perfect? No. He can say, we're still in process. We have a long way to go. What did the Apostle Paul said? It's not that I have arrived. I have a long way to go. And I thought he was the farthest one. But he said, I got a long way to go. But I stretch forward to that. And we're all in process. And people need to know we're not perfect. Who can relate to a perfect person? Not me. Just look at my life for a little while. And you know it's not perfect. And I can look at yours. So we're all in the same boat. Let's not put any straight. But I'll tell you what. There's a vast difference between knowing Jesus and not knowing him. I've got hope. I've got help. I've got assurance. These folks don't have it. They guess. They wonder. And, and God wants them to know. God wants them to do. I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from synagogue to the other to have them punished. So Paul is what at this point? A Christian persecutor throwing Christians in jail, and people are losing their lives. This is his story. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. Some of you have heard of what's going on in the world right now. We, we've, we've got people losing their lives, being forced like this. It hasn't ended. Do you realize how much the devil hates the church? And he doesn't want us. He wants to every way extinguish that message, have us not care, go on with our lives like everything's fine and not connect people to God. We can't let them win. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. And one of my journeys, I was going to Damascus with authority and commission. Of, he's a hard one. He's a tough case. But he's not too hard for God. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. And we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? And this is where Jesus comes in. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. And everything changed for the Apostle Paul. Did Paul share that story over and over and over like a broken record? You know one thing? There are some things I can't listen to people with anymore. I don't have patience for. Frivolous stuff, my mind starts to wander. But when I hear someone's story about how they come to Christ, I'm riveted. Have you ever noticed that? We go to the Baptist Builder trips. Brother Rick, what do we do? How many times have you heard Blackie Black's testimony? At least 10 times. How many of you uh, heard other people's testimony? 
Over and over again, you hang on the edge of your seat and you say, wow, I know that guy, I know that girl. Look what God has done. There's power in your testimony. Can you say amen to that? We overcame them how? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we love not our lives even unto the death. Your testimony, however mundane you think your story, is more powerful than you can imagine coupled with the word of God. You know how I know that's true? Because I wouldn't be saved today if it weren't for those two things. And neither would you. Show them the way. And this is my story. I told you last week, I hate to be a pastor that says stuff and doesn't do it. It is wrong for a pastor or a spiritual leader to stand and ask you to do stuff they won't do themselves. And I told you, I've been living in a certain place for over 20 years, and I have a neighbor. My neighbor, uh, I've invited him to church like two or three times in 20 years, and he said no, basically. His father died, and there was a little crack in the wall. He said, why don't you come? And, and, and he didn't. So I left him alone. I've been in the word of God and God has been convicting me. Burdening my heart. He comes and proclaims, we got to get together, we got to have an easement, some of your property goes through mine. Standing out in the woods with a line measuring how much of my road is on this guy's property, how much of his front yard is on mine, what we're going to do. But in my heart, God is saying, you got to tell this guy. He's moving. Your time's up. And you've had 20 years, 23 years, to tell him about me. And you haven't. Inviting him to church is not enough. Throwing God in the conversation every once in a while, not enough. And you know, he's got a wife. What about her? So I'm holding the line, I'm thinking about all that stuff, and I'm studying the scripture. How many of you are grateful for the word of God and conviction? So this is what we did. We got together with our neighbor. I went into their house. It's been the first time that I was in their house. Sat down at their table with the both of them. We started to talk. Conversation just about over. My wife's ready to get up. And the Holy Spirit of God, you know what it feels like. How many of you know what it feels like? <laughs> Look out. Because he will make your heart pound and he will put the pressure on. Why? Because he cares about people. My wife's getting up. And I said, oh, there, there's, there's something I'd really like to talk to you about. <clears throat> uh, if you don't mind. Was I scared? Yeah, I was scared. Was my wife getting ready to leave? Said, we're done. That was good. Let's leave it alone. Come back next time. And I said, there really is something I'd like to talk about. You know, I've been driving in, uh, past your house for 23 years. And you know I'm a Christian. And you know I'm a pastor. And uh, I've invited you to church a couple of times. But I, I just want to apologize right now that I haven't taken the time and sat down and shared my faith or the gospel with you. Would you mind if I did that? And do you think they both got up from the chairs, got me by the back of my belt, <laughs> threw me out in the parking lot? What do you think they did? They said, hey, go ahead. I said, Dan, you know, I've, I did invite you a couple of times, I said, but that really wasn't a good attempt. And I said, you folks are moving. You're going to move from this house to a new house. The Holy Spirit will help you. Did I start where they were? They're moving. And I said, you know, that's really great, and I'm excited for you. It's going to be a lot better place, a lot more land, it sounds like, and that's really, really exciting. I said, but you know, one day you're going to move again. You get where I'm going? One day, you're going to, I'm going to, we're all going to move from here, and we're going to make, 
we're going to go to another destination. And I said, I would like for you to know that that destination is going to be heaven and not hell. Do you have the assurance that's going to happen? This is real. This is last week in their home. And if you think I'm lying, get my wife. She'll tell you the truth all the time, more than you want to know sometimes. And I said, uh, I'm really concerned about you. And I said, uh, do you have any assurance that if you were to stand before God right now and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, this perfect new home where there's no lying or stealing or whatever, do you think that you would be invited in? And of course, one of them said, I don't have any idea. All I can do is hope. But the wife said, I think I have a pretty good idea. I'll be accepted in. And I said, why? And she said, well, you know, I've been a pretty good person. Have you heard that before? I think the idea is if you haven't killed anybody, you know, you, you haven't extorted or murdered, you know, uh, you've got a good chance of getting into heaven. And so I explained to them, I said, do you mind if I shared with you what the Bible says? A lot of people have different answers. Oh, boy, I'm making a mess of this today. And so I just simply and gently, along the way I said, listen, if you guys are tired of listening to me, you don't want to hear this, just tell me to shut up and, and we'll leave. And they never said that. As a matter of fact, they were very interested. And once I got past the, well, getting to heaven is not like a gigantic scale where you put your good stuff on this side and your bad stuff on that side. And if you have a little more good stuff, it tips in your favor and you get into heaven. And I simply said, do you mind if I share what the Bible says about this? We talked for a long time. They asked questions. I got to the place where I said, you know, you know, we would love to have you come to church, but it's not about church. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you have one? And do you need help? Now, we didn't get to a, they prayed a prayer for salvation. But I left them with a nice track. They said they were very interested. They said I could talk to them some more, and they would like that. And then they said this, we are deeply concerned about our children. Because we, we have a son, and he goes to a particular college that's not far. It's an Ivy League school. It's brilliant. He, he would rather read than fish. He tells the story, we'd go fishing, and he'd be reading a book. He'd get a bite, he'd put the book down, be disappointed, catch the fish, and then go back to reading the book like it was no big deal. He said, the guy's brilliant. But he said, he... And every one of his friends believes nothing. They have no faith at all. They don't know God, and they don't believe that he even exists. And somebody's got to reach those young men with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And my friends... It's got to be you, and it's got to be me. And the scenario I just described to you has to happen over and over and over and over and over again, and it can. And folks, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing someone know God. Their whole worldview changes. I've had people say, Pastor, it's like a brand new life. It's like a whole new plane of existence for me, knowing Christ. Isn't that true? So I want to ask you this morning as I close, will you start where they are? We are in desperate need. This 51 Christians to, to lead one person to Christ. And I don't know what our ratio is in this church, but I just want to ask you in your heart of hearts, did you hear the word of God this morning? It's not enough to hear it. We've got to do it. You have got to make time to be with your friends. You, you have got to make time to, to share with this doctor you go to. And you see him at least a couple times a year. 
And you, you, you've got to be able to talk to that teacher that was important to you. And it doesn't matter how smart they are. Like one guy said, nonsense uttered by a scientist is still nonsense. <laughs> Amen? We don't have to be intimidated. And the Bible says, a fool says in his heart that there's no God. It's nonsense is what it is. And we know that. How many of you will commit yourself to sharing Jesus this year? I mean, really, you can do it. And I want to help you as your pastor. If you need evangelism training, Brother George, I don't know where George is, Bertrand, he said, Pastor, why don't you write this down, put it on a little card, why don't you train our people to go out and share the gospel? And uh, I said, George, I need to do that. But folks, we can't get stalled with a moving message and then go home and do the same thing we've done for the last 20 years. Getting lost on our way to the mission and never doing what the main priority really is. How many of you are ready for a change? We got to change for them. Because we're their only hope. Yeah, it's you. It's, it's you. It's me. It's all of us sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's doable. We can do it. And we're going to see results. And this is what the results are going to be. Okay? You already know before you start. Some are going to say what? Yes, I believe. Some are going to do that. Some are going to say what? No, I'm not going to. And some are going to say, i got to think this over. Are you prepared to accept that? <laughs> so let's go do it. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for my church. And Lord, our money's down. It really is. But our mission is more needed than ever before. We're going to have less dollars to do more than we ever had before. But it's not doing a good stuff, Father. It is about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with a meaningful way. I mean, Lord, we, we need to get out there as a church, the whole, the whole church beyond our church, Father. How can we have 5,000 member churches with no baptisms at all that year? And it's just got to end because you grieve and weep over the lost. And, and we have got to use our relationships, Lord, if we're a football nut, if we are a sports addict, if we are so into sewing and ballet, or if we are, uh, Lord, sick and have cancer. We have so many commonalities with the people we have. All of those are pathways. They are connections to share Jesus Christ, which is the greatest need of every individual that's ever faced the, walked the face of the earth. How I pray for my neighbors, Lord, before they go, I want to see them saved. How could it be that I have a treasure and they would go away lost as ever? And not only do I have them as neighbors, there's the guy down the street. And then there's that village of Clinton. And there's Whitesboro. And there's Utica. And they walk and they don't know. Some of them think they have a relationship with you and they're lost. They're a million miles away from heaven and an inch away from hell. No different than in Paul's day. So burden us, Father, I pray. If there's someone here who is understanding the gospel for the first time, for God so loved the world that he only begot the Son. He gave his only begotten Son. We're all sinners, like the last point of my sermon. And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Confess with your lips and believe in your heart that Jesus is God's Son. God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. For it is by grace you are saved, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Father, we have the word, and we need to share it with people. And Lord, I pray that we see many, many people, men and women, boys and girls, coming to Jesus Christ regularly. So Lord, we love you today. I've done my best, Lord. Help me to do more and better, Lord. But we simply can't get lost on the way to our mission. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand.